Okay, so first, um, Carol and Lynette, I'd love to have you each describe sure. just a little bit about your organizations and your background, just to give everyone an idea of how you're approaching this work and um, we can move forward from there. So Carol, I'll let you go ahead and start and, and then Lynette, I'll have you go next. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I've been an advisor to 100 Women Strong on the issue of violence against women for quite some time. And um, part of my work has really been to help change systems around violence against women, because oftentimes there are very simple things that we can do to systems that can have a significant ripple effect. And um, uh, my company, Charity Global, um, does a lot of work around violence against women. We do um, support organizations that do this work um, internationally and um, try to help organizations build capacity and impact and be able to measure that impact so that they can attract major donors. So um, one of the things that I had done over the last summer is um, do a pilot with another organization, Children's Home Society, to see whether or not if we implemented evidence-based assessment tools, if we could really shift the way that the system responded to survivors. And so I had brought this information to 100 Women Strong, really um, interested in um, their desire to economically empower women, but coming from a place of let's go out and hunt for these women. My take on it was really, look, recent research shows us that 99.3% uh, of all women experienced violence at the hands of a man. Uh, most of those incidents happen before the age of 18. And so oftentimes you don't even, you know, you, we're just not asking the right questions. And so let's step back and put some assessment in front of a really great program that's already having an impact economically. And you may find that most of the people that you're working with are in fact survivors, but we just need to shift the way that the, um, the tools are presented so to already serve the people that you're already serving who already are survivors who just haven't asked the right question. So that's kind of how I approached this and came into this work. Um, and my role is really gonna be to support Lynette and the team at Poverty Solutions and provide that, that background of um, violence against women work and helping them um, implement some new tools to their already wonderful program. It's a routine, Lynette. Okay, well, I'm Lynette Fields and I'm uh, the executive director of Poverty Solutions Group. We launched in early 2020 um, and uh, we're a new organization, but we bring experience with us and a track record and outcomes with us. Um, we launched as a nonprofit after having been funded through St. Luke's United Methodist Church to explore best practices, emerging best practices, really across the country that we could really focus on reducing poverty. So often our approaches, whether it's through government or a church or nonprofit, have much more to focus on managing poverty, managing the current crisis, rather than helping take people all the way to economic stability. So St. Luke's funded us for six years, a team, uh, which was really awesome to, um, to consider what um, might work to, to start to move the needle um, which on um, poverty, which hasn't really happened in my adult lifetime, particularly when it comes to the number of children who live in poverty. And so we brought into, in with us in this new organization outcomes like um, helping to increase uh, household income by 56%, uh, reducing the uh, dependency on public benefits by 39%, helping people increase their credit score by 70 points or more, um, 
and most importantly, helping people build uh, social capital. Um, and we do that primarily through um, an organ, uh, a model called Circles, which is um, national. Um, so we're able to continually work with a network of people across the country um, that accelerates our ability to adapt um, to kind of the best knowledge out there in what's working. Um, in addition to circles, we also do um, education um, in the professional um, arena in helping people increase their poverty IQ and understanding the obstacles that keep people in poverty. And even though Carol and Charity and, and uh, Poverty Solutions Group are looking at different but related <laughs> issues, we also wanna look at the system. So are there policies um, nationally, Circles USA has um, six different policy platforms um, to uh, partner with and address that can really um, help in people getting permanently out of poverty and really ending the cycle of generational poverty. So I was brought in about a year ago um, I was invited by 100 Women Strong and Central Florida Foundation um, as a subject matter expert on poverty as this group was beginning to explore what was the intersection. And we really spent a good six months in developing the model. How is circles adaptable enough? Um, and can we take the learnings that Carol has through Charity um, and all the things she just shared about assessment tools and process mapping and asking the right questions. Um, and we found that it was a really good fit. Um, Circles already has financial literacy. We already have economic stability tools. What we're missing is um, a specifically related to violence against women and financial coercion. And so we're going to adapt our financial literacy model um, and, and uh, we're in the midst right now of how we have a team of 11 that are um, going through training that's often for professionals in the field. And we're taking people with lived experience of poverty and many who have are survivors of domestic violence and designing uh, a way for us to adapt our, our model so we can, we can add um, specific resources to survivors of domestic violence and or identify people who might be specifically at risk. And I'm sure Carol, Carol has it right off the top of her head. And, and Renuka and other people from 100 Women Strongs have, have been talking about the return rate when that's specifically related to financial resources. So yeah, 75% of women who go into an emergency domestic violence shelter um, end up either homeless or having to return to their abuser. And most often it's because of lack of resources related to financial uh, capacity. That is absolutely shocking. I mean, it's not shocking that it's happening, which is sad and horrible, but it's, I cannot believe that the statistic is so high. And it sounds like this is gonna be a real effort that's gonna help divert that sort of that crossroads right there. Thank you for giving us an overview of both of the programs. Carol, did you have something else you wanna add there? Well, I was just gonna say, you know, and, and that statistic um, sadly has been, twisted to say women go back an average of seven times as if they want to go back because there's some sort of desire to reunite with their offender as opposed to they're forced to go back because they don't have the financial resources to stay out and stay safe with their children. Mm -hmm. It's really so important it's to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I'd love to talk um, a little bit more specifically about how you're 
how the program will run and once you're getting started with the um, the circles groups and the cohorts can you walk us through a little bit Lynette specifically like how what the process will be like and the amount of time um, people will spend in the circles program could you walk us down that to explain what it would be like for somebody participating oh I have you on mute <laughs> um, I think part of the appeal or willingness to explore this partnership is because we're not needing to start anything from square one so Poverty Solutions Group already has the circles model, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Charity already, has, and Carol specifically, has years of experience with domestic violence and is particularly looking at changing trends so we can be more effective. Um, and uh, there's a, already a financial literacy course put together from by Allstate Foundation um, that um, has put in this financial coercion piece. So we're melding and adapting all of those in, into a, a process where we believe we can really um, look at the overlap with poverty and domestic violence. So um, circles is a different type of approach uh, to poverty and we, uh, we identify people who are below 200% of the poverty level. Um, we are not a social service agency and we don't replace the crisis intervention that a lot of government and church and nonprofit groups do. Um, we wanna kind of take the baton in a relay and, and develop a long-term relationship and help people get all the way to economic stability. Um, and it's a two generation um, model as well. So as parents are learning skills, so are their children, which we really believe will help disrupt that generational um, cycle. So we identify people who are lo low income, we call them circle leaders. And then, and they go through extensive training in understanding, understanding what poverty and the constraints of poverty are. Now that might sound um, strange that we're teaching people who live in poverty about poverty, but people, especially the same kind of thing that Carol said about domestic violence, we have a tendency to blame the individual alone for the state that they're in. So helping people understand what's going on in the larger community is really helpful. Helping people meet other people in the same situation is really helpful. So we also talk about there are resources that you need other than money, you know, like support system, understanding the hidden roles of class, um, mental and physical health, um, and SMART goals. Um, so we do that training with the leaders together. Simultaneously, we are identifying uh, volunteers, middle, upper middle class. I know one of the things i am uh, been asked to inject into this conversation is how can people get involved? This is right the place where people can get involved. We need allies always. Um, thank you, Chantel, that, um, for the, the clap there. Um, Chantel's a part of Circles and on our board. Uh, we recruit um, volunteers who also go through significant training. And that's one of the things that I think really sets our, um, this model apart. Um, Volunteers often are trained in the logistics on how to help, but not necessarily in the why the issue exists in the first place. So our volunteers go through understanding the hidden rules of class, understanding why there's poverty, just increasing their poverty IQ. We have this um, module called Bridges Out of Poverty that's related to the work of Ruby Payne, if anybody is familiar with that. We have a poverty simulation that we ask our volunteers to go through. And um, there's an online training also through Circles. So we, we do significant preparation, which takes three to four months. Then we put people together and we match them intentionally. 
So the goals and the plans of the leaders, we look at the skills and the talents and the interests of the allies. And we even do matching exercises, even what we call speed dating, so that it's, um, and people write letters and, and get to request who they think they're a good match with. So it's not an arbitrary staff assignment or a single solitary mentor. We put at least two allies with a leader and then they still walk 18 more months at a minimum together. Now that may sound like a lot of time for volunteers. It goes really very fast. We have many of our allies that repeat um, this process with more than one leader. We have leaders who become allies themselves and building that sense of community um, we don't just send them off by themselves. We meet on a particular night all together, and we may do community learning or, or meet in individual match circles. So I spent time digging into that just to help this group understand why this is a different kind of model. It's, it's very relational. It's very long-term. So we have the opportunity to um, really work with the risks that people might have in experience domestic violence and really helping um, not just learn the financial literacy, but to put it into practice. And part of the funding of the grant even goes towards, we have financial tools like a credit restoration loan and a short-term loan that helps people build the practice um, and build up their credit score. Um, that and these are tools that are often not available at all to low income people um, because their credit scores aren't good or because the interest rates are so high for loans. Um, and so we just think this is a really good match to take this long term program and then um, kind of overlay a top of a sensitivity to. Um, domestic violence so that we're better equipped as staff and volunteers to um, identify households really that are at risk. So I think, I think that covered, covered most of that. So question, if not a couple of more questions. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions so far? If you do, um place them in the chat. One question I had, Lynette, is how would someone get connected to the program? Is it like a referral from another organization or how would they get to be able to participate in the Circle program? So there, the locations for Circles are place-based. So we really try to have um, larger than a neighborhood, but, you know, but, but regions. And we know our counties are divided up into to different areas. So right now we have circles in West Orange, a location, and we have circles um, Orlando. And so we have community partners. Each location has a collaboration. So um, the host organization in West Orange is still St. Luke's United Methodist Church. We work with other churches. We've had referrals from Head Start, from social workers, from once you get started, circle leaders refer other circle, you know, their friends and connections. And then our partner, our host organization in Circles Orlando is Family Promise. And so already built in, they have the circle leaders. The main work with Family Promise will be to recruit the, the allies. So, but even though you have a host organization, both locations will still take additional people. You don't have to come through one particular channel. Um, we have two locations now. I think the other appeal to this um, is that we're going to grow locations, especially when we get out of this pandemic. And we're going to have, this is not a one-time thing. We're going to learn skills that we're going to be able to take in to all of our future locations and all of the cohorts within each of those locations. And since it's a national model, we'll get to share what we've learned with circles across the country. That's really incredible. I love how each 
piece like builds on the other piece and how community is at the essence of all of it. I think that's so important because uh, we, we just can't go through life or challenges alone. There's some great questions that have come in from the chat. Um, Joellen is asking when and how will 101 Strong Women be able to sign up to participate? And um, if you're interested, go ahead and leave us your, your name and we can make sure to get you connected with Lynette um, to make sure that we can get you set up for that. Um, okay, one question, Kimberly, she said, I've done a little reading on the cycle of abuse, but I'm no means an expert. From what I've read, the cycle of abuse can emotionally bond the victim to the user. Will the program address this emotional side as well? So um, actually um, the, the next training that we're doing is on complex trauma. And um, it's something that unfortunately a lot of advocates and not even a lot of therapists study. And that emotional bond is really more about complex trauma and about um, the uh, learned helplessness that comes from being trapped without being able to see that there are options. Um, oftentimes because those options really aren't there. I mean, you've tried to get out, you've called the police, you've told people whatever and and had that those doors slammed in your face. Um, so yes, we will be training on that. And um, the training actually helps, um, again, they're, they're not, um, for the most part, professionals, social workers, therapists, that the training normally works with, it's, it's allies and, and survivors. And, and so we're adapting the training, but it really is about understanding how layers of trauma and living in a traumatic environment over months and years changes one psyche. And then how you help that person recover from that is very different than say someone who just experienced a one-time trauma. Um, not that both can't experience PTSD, but it's very different when you have complex trauma and the recovery of, of that looks very, very different. And so, yes, the answer is yes, we are covering that and we are going to be integrating that into this model. One of the things I've shared with the, the grant teams, a grant team already is how just talking about this grant and putting together an application process for the design team has already brought a lot to the surface. And people are telling, some people I've known for a few years are telling stories that they wouldn't necessarily tell um, or have told before. Um, naming it makes it a safer space, but it also provides a rawness and vulnerability so a part of the resources we already try to identify in circles are if people do need some mental and emotional support. And I anticipate that just in the few weeks we've been working on this already, that we will, it will benefit all of us who are involved to kind of ramp up and, and really be, um, uh, more proactive um, in helping to um, identify how people can process what just this grant has brought to the surface. Does that, does that make sense? Well, part of this is predicated on a, a research study done in the UK. Um, that found that if you go in and just say, are you a victim of domestic violence? Most people will answer no. But if you ask specific questions about types of violence that people have experienced, that's when it goes from literally no to 99.3%. And the study we did um, with the Children's Home Society and Charity did, we found that 8% of families in the child welfare system were identified as having active duty. But when you use evidence-based assessment tools with the right questions, as 99% had active domestic violence and 72% of that 
had severe lethal danger currently present. So they were missing you know, nearly 97 or uh, not 97, they were missing 89% um, uh, of domestic violence cases. And these are trained professionals that work in the abuse field that have been trained by other professionals to identify this. And not only were they missing it, they were missing the, the danger that these mothers were in. And because of that, mothers are losing their children. They're being blamed. They're being asked to go to shelter as if that's some sort of end solution. And a lot of these women are living in poverty already. And so, um, that's what we're hoping to bring to the table with this as well is, you know, if you can open that conversation up, if we all were able to open that conversation up, we could, would find that, in fact, the vast majority of women have experienced um, violence and significant violence. Thanks for sharing that, Carol. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about Lynette and Carol just this is a two-year investment from 100 Women Strong, um, and this is a 100 Women Strong is focused on for the next three years empowering women um, financially. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about once we get to the two years, what um, are you hoping to have accomplished? What are you hoping to see? Um, and I think obviously one of the things you touched on was seeing this model, seeing that it works, and being able to have it roll up on a national level to impact even more women and families would be incredible. Um, but I'd love to have you talk a little bit about what you envision um, for the two years and what it will hopefully look like once we get to that mark. Yeah, a, a, a year long grant cycle for reducing poverty is just not enough time. Um, so I'm really, really grateful to 100 Women Strong for being able to to stretch it out a little bit longer. Um, we really work with people for almost two full years between the recruitment, the training, and the, and the minimum of 18 months. Um, and it's really when you get to 18 to 24 months that you begin to see the better outcomes when it comes to economic sustainability. Um, for those of us who may not have um, ever lived in generational poverty, it may be hard to imagine, but, but if you, if you haven't had another experience, it, it just, it takes a lot of time. Um, so we're piloting a design team and working with cohorts in West Orange, because that's our oldest location. Um, and what we're going to be doing in this first year, uh, as we shared, is going through a six-hour really in-depth uh, domestic violence uh, training for the design team. Then the design team will, will kind of break up and, and um, follow three different threads that we're going to do. One is uh, process mapping, identifying where we can maybe interview, ask the question differently, as Carol says. Um, another group will be um, melding the financial literacy. So uh, the, the financial literacy that we've been using that we think we've tried several modules that really, really is effective with people who are low income. And then adding these pieces from um, Allstate, uh, Allstate Foundation Moving Ahead curriculum that has financial coercion. And then the third part is preparing people to be safety planners so that when we do ask the question, we're, we're ready to respond. So that's going to be the work of the first year. And then our hope in the second year is we can begin to, um, to fold it out into our other location. And, and my personal hope is that we can even take parts of the financial literacy um, into that, our two gen model. So we already have a children's and, and youth model. If we can begin to teach both male and female teens, what some of the warning signs are, that really creates a lot of hope for me that, that we can disrupt not just generational poverty, but disrupt some of the violence that happens within the home. Um, so that's what we see. We'll work with, um, our other community partners in um, Circles Orlando and, and begin to move into the, 
second generation. And, and I'm really hoping um, that, you know, what we learn here can be crafted into really a white paper that is shared with other poverty or anti-poverty organizations, uh, groups that, you know, do this kind of work because, you know, we have to start showing the impact and the, um, the way that just integrating some very cost-effective, I mean, it's really, there's a grant to support this, but the curriculum is free, um, you know, and the, for, you know, minimal cost, you could implement and change in your programs and have a really dramatic effect on people who are living in poverty, who are most affected by negative systemic reactions. I'm gonna put it that way, it's probably a kind way of putting it, but um, are most you know, vulnerable to the system uh, doing bad things to them because they are in an abusive relationship. So that's kind of my hope too, is that Lynette and, um, you know, can, can get out there and really um, get out on some stages and really talk about this and really share um, what I'm hoping is gonna be a really significant um, shift in their program. I do think the potential applications are numerous. <laughs> um, you know, how, how in the long, like, so we're talking now, right now, how do we adapt it within circles? But if a circles adapts and becomes a more DV sensitive organization, is there a way for us to partner with DV shelters and create a much longer support community for people who, because yes, money is the issue, but social capital, your relationships, I can't imagine that isn't an issue. Part of what happens in domestic violence is, and the coercion is isolation from friends and family, you know? And, and uh, so maybe there's some things we can, um, connections we can make um, all sorts of ways. We're, we're just focusing on the pilot project, right? right now. And, and as I shared, Circles USA is already, they're waiting, you know, to, for our webinar and what we, what we learn that will be well into 2022, but we know we're going to learn something and we'll want to share it with other chapters. That's incredible. Thank you. Um, I, Chant, Chantal Carr is on. Do you, is this a good time, Rachel? Yeah, this would be great. I was going to say, we'd I'd love to have Chantel share her story. And then I think if there aren't any other questions, we would could wrap it up on that positive, inspiring note of Chantel's yeah. story. Well, and I'll, the picture yeah, there. I'll just introduce her. So yeah. Chantel came to us as a circle leader um, and she was ready. She was, <laughs> she just was ready to be really committed. And um not only has she been a circle leader, but she's been a bridging ally to another circle leader. She's been a facilitator in some of our training. We try, um, we're really intentional and committed to having those voices of lived experience become a part of the preparation process as soon as people are ready. And we're also committed to having the voices of those with lived experience at every level of our organization. So Chantel um, serves on our board of directors as well. Um, she has an incredibly compelling story. So Chantel, whatever you feel comfortable sharing in this venue, we would um, be happy to hear. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here, for your time and your attention to this very, very serious matter. Um, it's only by the grace of God that I'm here right now because a lot of women who have been through what I've been through are locked up, shot up, or dead. And as we're going through this training and we're hearing these statistics from Carol, it's, it's really triggering, but I'm encouraged to know that we now have such great support from you guys at 100 Women Strong and Central Florida Foundation to continue to reach out and assist other women. Um, this is a real deal and poverty really equals slavery. And if you are in poverty, your aggressor, your um, abuser, can keep you as that slave. And that's why those numbers are so high because there's no other way out. Um, circles was my way out. I was 
going to a church, a small group told me about um, another small group. It was Parenting and Single. And my facilitator in Parenting and Single mentioned, hey, there's a program called Circles. I hear you're wanting to start a business. Maybe they could assist you. So I signed up and wasn't really sure what was going to happen. I had to wait a year to get in based on how the um, admission was at the time. Um, but when I did, like when I said, I, I hit the ground running, I had never seen such a holistic program that really wraps around me and my children to assist us, to care for us, to love on us. And I was used to not sharing my story. I, was, I wouldn't let anyone know what, what I was dealing with based on cultural, um, you know, the way I was brought up culturally, it's like you keep it to yourself. And so I started calling helplines. I would call like United Way 211. I asked them one time, how many times have I called you guys in the past, you know, couple, maybe a year? They were like, oh, you've called about 45 times. And at that point, I was like, I need some real friends, real people. And so circles became that. It became real people that I could go to every week with my children, with my to-do list, with my issues. I went through a divorce while I was in circles. I had the assistance of my allies. Um, I, you know, had losses, car accidents. I had three car accidents in two years where I was out of a car and my circles, allies and family assisted me in that. Um, I've had all type of things happen, like the death of my father. I was able to get assistance from the circles community to do what I needed to do. Um, tutoring for my 10th grader when she's now in probability and statistics that I aged out at algebra, maybe she's able to get tutoring from my circles families. Um, I've increased my credit score to close to 700 now. Um, I've started my own business, which is a, a consulting firm um, where I now offer personal development and leadership development classes to assist other women. Um, I have been on the board of Poverty Solutions Group. I'm also co-chair on another social entrepreneur community group. And so help is essential. And if we don't get that help, sometimes it's sink or swim. Um, I put together a whole video on the power of social capital, which is something I was really impoverished in. That's why I was calling the helplines. But when I got to circles, I got to learn all those ins and outs, those hidden languages, all those trainings and help myself. And so this is an amazing partnership. I see great things in the future for everyone involved. Um, I would just encourage you to share what we're doing here with your friends and plug in however you can, and you will not be disappointed. And that's coming from me here four years in <laughs> to this work. So thank you, Carol. Thank you, Lynette, Rachel, and everyone else for being here today. Thank you so much for sharing, Chantal. Your story is so inspiring and how you've been able to also help other women in a similar situation. I, that to me is just really so powerful and, and so generous. Um, and it's just incredible to see how Circles has been able to help and create a community around you to, to help you move forward. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I, I just wanna say thank you so much to Lynette and to Carol for sharing and um, for everyone for joining today, we've been recording this session and we'll be able to share it with others that weren't able to make it, but um, this is such a powerful program and a powerful grant opportunity that is just going to make such a huge difference. Um, so thank you all so much. I know Lynette, um, you shared earlier how people can get involved um, that want to be part of either mentoring or part of the Part of the circles program can you just share one more time um, for us how people should connect with you here's our website and here's my email address um, and if you if you go to <laughs> trying to talk and type and not misspell i think i did okay <laughs> Um, if you either way, uh, if you go scroll to circles, there are actually um, applications um, there for Ally. Um, we're currently recruiting cohort nine in Circles West Orange. The leaders are in training, and we need a couple more allies. So those of you who live in the west part of town, that would 
be fantastic. I think we need just one or two more. And then in the late spring, we'll be recruiting for our um, second cohort in Circles Orlando. Um, so please uh, reach out. Yeah, Leslie? Yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm sorry I was having technical difficulties and didn't join earlier. And I've, I've been a little bit unplugged over the last few weeks, but I'm getting uh, back into it, back engaged. Uh, but I, I wanted, and I may have missed it in the beginning of the meeting because I, I wasn't uh, logged in yet. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about kind of the timeline of what to expect over the next um, several weeks as far as where the project is and what's coming up next? Um, and then I also wanted to, if, if we didn't do this in the beginning, um, and I see Joellen uh, Ross is here, and we have some other uh, leaders that we just elected and approved that you saw at the event that were introduced on the grants team itself. And so we're, we're redesigning the roles of who does what a little bit, but um, Joellen's role in particular is to work with our, our grantees and our partners to help our members get more engaged and help us to think about making connections with with other partners in the community that might help with the grant and might get engaged in the grant. So I guess, long story short, what I'm two part question, one is the timing of where you are with the project, but then also to let you know that after the first of the year, and the, the real delay is on me, um, that nothing on this side has happened in the last few weeks, but after the first of the year, we're going to meet as a grants team and and get smarter about who's doing what and how we move forward together and how we can help you to make this grant even better um, and what our role uh, can be moving forward and how to engage our members more. Um, so I'd love to reach out to you after the first of the year, both of you, um, Lynette and Carol, to to so that we can get that conversation going and and can really um, help and, and get more engaged in the in the project moving forward. And and Joellen and I did connect at hundred the celebration because you 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 ask us to leslie so we did yes. we did that good. Good. um we're actually have already started the six hour in-depth training so this friday will be the second module the second two-hour module and then we'll finish that up in january and then we'll um begin the process mapping and and then the adapting of financial literacy we also have another more general two hour training that, um, and Carol put it, it's in the chat box early, um, early on in this session that we can open up to 100 Women Strong. I think the more people that take that, the better. So that would be something that's open to the whole group. And I think the other way is, is just getting involved. If you wanna walk alongside somebody, that is a powerful thing. I know you all are busy and I know you think it sounds like 18 months is is huge. It, it's, it is big. I don't want to undersell the commitment, but it it's not as daunting as it might appear from the um, outside. So I would encourage you um, to get involved. And, and uh, Chantal's ally was on for a little while, Karen, um, she could and that's one of the things that's cool like years afterwards they're still leader and ally are still connected and do things together often um that doesn't happen every time but sometimes it does um so i does that answer leslie that kind of the you know if there are people that are really um have taught financial literacy before and and want to get involved with that, we we could probably use a few more facilitators because we want to offer the financial literacy course beyond circles as a way to maybe um, somebody ask about how we identify people. It might be a way to get people into the circles program um, by offering that. Uh, we would want you to go through some of our poverty awareness training um, to pair with your financial awareness. Um, but that would be another way. So going through the two hour training, becoming an ally, or if you want to, if you have that financial literacy background and we can add um, poverty sensitivity and understanding the trauma of poverty. Um, and we would also want you to go through at least that two hour DV training, I think as well. Um, those would be all ways I think you could 
um, become involved. Okay. Um, and then as we roll this out more, you know, there we'll have ways to help with the two second generation and, and we always need allies. Have I said that enough? Is it coming? <laughs> I just like this group, I'm just thinking has some fabulous allies in it. So. I agree. Joella, did you have anything to add? I didn't mean to speak for you. No, I'm so glad you jumped in. Um, I'm off you. Um, no, I just think that, you know, some of us are just going to have to jump in and, and sort through some of it and then disseminate to 100 women strong what exactly is the way to start. Or maybe we'll do some of the training and then share what it's like so that other people will be interested because it's, 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 Lynette, it's just like a little bit overwhelming being on the outside and not like how much is the time commitment and, you know, 18 months, is it once a week for 18 months or, you know, it's just, we're not close enough to the details, I don't think at this point, um, but we'll get there. So it just takes some time. Yeah, and after the new year, we just had our last one last week. We have information meetings to help answer those questions, and we have an ally and leader. Um, I had shared about the one that we had last week, but it's December, and people are you know up to their eyeballs. So we'll have some of those again in um, after you know probably not till February because we want to do it when it's um, close to recruiting the next class. And you just got to start. Yeah. If you start somewhere, it is, mm -hmm. it can be overwhelming, especially if you're new to both understanding the trauma related to domestic violence and new to understanding and becoming more aware of the impact of poverty. Because poverty is, a, is more than not having money, being right. in generational poverty. Um, and Sally's on here too. I thought maybe that was you. Sally's from uh, Circles Orlando. She's a, one of our new leaders in the first cohort. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you. I showed my face because I wanted to say something to the ladies that's in here, all the people. Oh, that's go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Sally. I'm a Circles leader from Orlando. Um, I just became a, a co-facilitator for um, Cohort 9. Um, and... For me, I entered circles because I um, was in poverty, am in poverty, let me say that. I am in poverty right now, trying to, my, to get out. I've got my two allies, which are great. I love them. Um, and, but we are also in the beginning stage of getting to know one another and um, trying to work on my SMART goals and things that I have going on. I also suffer from... Um, bipolar disorder. So it's a little tough for me um, with my emotions and stuff, but my allies are amazing. They help with talking through things that I need. Um, I have four children. I have my oldest also suffer from bipolar. They help me with him. Uh, we've come to a point now where we can talk and um, we're great with one another right now um I see a difference within my children a difference within my household all from being in circles um my perspective on life has changed um I'm breaking those generational curses through circles I am pushing myself I am facing my fears I am uh someone who is afraid of, of public speaking and I am pushing those barriers to get out of poverty so I can then be able to help other females get out of poverty themselves. I also um, was in a domestic violence relationship for 10 years. Uh, it was very hard. And like Chantel said, uh, because of our uh, cultural background is uh, what happens at home stays at home. We have the um, Vegas theme. Um, we don't talk. So a lot of the 10 years of going through that, I endured it alone without speaking to anyone, no family members. Uh, I'm now 
able, we, me and my kid's father broke up uh, eight years ago. I want to say four years ago is when I really realized what was really happening. Um, I can say in the 10 years, I knew the abuse was happening. I didn't consider it domestic abuse. I considered it living. That's how we were. And that's, we were just toxic with one another and didn't know how or why, or if I should get out of it because of the children, the stability, uh, what people would think. But when I finally did get out of it, um, I didn't look back. I just kept running. Now I'm in a place where I am trying to get over all the traumatic stuff that's happened in my life. And um, sorry, I don't want to cry. Uh, it's hard. It's hard when you know you're in a situation you shouldn't be in, but you love that person. Um, and sometimes, like they say, hurt people hurt people. Um, but sometimes it gets too much. And when you have to get out, you have to get out. Um, and now that I'm out, I want to reach back and fix that in me. So then I can also then in return, um, help other females that's also been in that position. Me and my kid's father are in a place now where we've talked about it and we've come, you know, we've apologized, I've apologized and and stuff like that. But sometimes that alone, that closure alone isn't enough to get over that um, trauma and that pain that causes you to then fall back a little bit. You then also sometimes, because I have bipolar, it puts me in that depressive mode. And, and because I suffer from being in poverty, I then slip even more and go deeper into depression and shut off from the world. With circles, I know that I can't shut out from the world. I have people that when I do shut myself out from the world, they know how to turn the knob and come in and say, hey, are you okay? And that's all we need sometimes. So an ally, to become an ally is an amazing thing. It's something that us circle leaders, we may not know it, but we need it. We need somebody to stand by us to say, hey, it's okay. Even if you don't have the answer to know you have a positive energy person next to you to hold you, to walk you through something or just listen to you and not judge you, it makes you wanna push more. And it makes you wanna get out of that poverty. It makes you wanna do the best for your kids. And it's pushed me to be, be a better person than I was before. And every time Circle says, hey, we have this going on, we're thinking about this, I, I am the first to try to jump on the boat to find out what it is. Is it something for me? Is it something good? What is it about? Because I want to be better, to be better, to help that people be better too. And I wanna thank you guys all for being here and letting me share my story. And once again, I'm gonna be like Lynette, we need allies. We definitely need allies. <laughs> See, that's what I was gonna say, Leslie. How could you, how could you hear that and not wanna be an ally? <laughs> thank you so much, Sally. Yeah, that's a great that's a great way to to wrap up. Does I don't know that anyone can follow that. And and by the way, I, did anyone have a clue that you are in any way scared of public speaking? Because by the way, even though this is two D, that was public speaking, and that was some amazing public speaking. So thank you um, for sharing that, uh, Sally and and Chantel for sharing your story. It really helps to give us to really get us engaged and committed and and jazzed about this grant so i want i'm hoping that more the rest of our membership is going to watch this recording and listen to that so thank you for sharing your story it's very important for us to hear um and if there's is one final call for any questions or anything while we still got lynette i know carol had to go um and then we'll wrap it up so thank you for being here today um anybody have any final question before we go okay yeah, I 
real quick, sharing that. Um, what I really like what we're doing with this relationship with charity are getting about the user as well. A lot of time we just put them on the shelf and we continue to move on, but they'll continue to perpetuate this cycle. And I really think that we have this thing and we can start to look at the whole family this situation. So I do think that we are getting on this issue. I don't know if, if you could hear all that, but I think I picked it up. Chantal, you're coming, your sound was going in and out. But okay. but what I heard you say was that we're looking at the whole family and Carol's training is helping us not just focus on the victim. We talk about survivor, but also um, learning more about the abuser and what needs to change in regards to um, the abuser and how we handle them, that not just to put all the, the burden on the person that's getting the abuse. Did I get it pretty close, Chantal? Yes, yes, that's it. It just, it, the whole model represents healing for families. So thank you. Which makes you really understand, Lynette, you've made a, the point a few times about wanting to make this your uh, multi-generational approach. And I think it's it's so important to, to look at the whole family. So thank you for making that point. Um, and we just learn so much every time we have one of these sessions. So I really appreciate, Lynette, I know these sessions come around fairly regularly where we ask you to participate in the events, but I think it's all part of the valuable process and the valuable partnership that we have uh, with you and with uh, Carol. So um, again, thank you for today and I appreciate Rachel, you stepping in um, and facilitating and you know, we're, we're a tag team around here, you know, cause we've all got things going on uh, behind the scenes. Um, but thank you to everyone. And if I, we don't talk to you, I hope you all have a happy holiday. And uh, Lynette, we will definitely uh, reach out after the first of the year and uh, get, get organized about how we can uh, work together moving forward with this grant. Anything else to add, Rachel, before we sign off? I don't have anything else, but thank you, Leslie, for being here. And thank you, um, Chantel and Sally, for sharing your stories. It really means so, so much to hear your personal experience. Um, and thank you, Lynette. And even though Carol had to leave, we appreciate everything you're doing um, at all the different levels and all across the board. So thank you so much. And we'll send out the recording. Um, so that way, if you want to listen in again or um, share it with somebody, and that way uh, members that weren't able to make it today can can hear what was um, discussed. So appreciate it all so much. And Rachel, Chantal did put the link for her, what yeah. you call the suitcase video in there. That I just pulled it up on my screen so I can include okay. it. Okay. <laughs> and Chantal, you're okay with that being shared within 100 Women Strong, aren't you? Yes. Is that I'm okay? okay. Uh, I, that's the video that changed my life. Oh that my God. Video changed my life. And even after I had a whole conversation with Chantel, I didn't even notice it was her. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but that video changed my life. And she was like, I did that video. So yes, that I think awesome. something that everybody should watch. Okay. Well, since you're okay with it, we'll include it um, <laughs> with the recording. <laughs> Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Rachel. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you, Leslie. Oh, thank you, Lynette. Talk soon. <laughs>